hit the record button here. I'll start the recording now. Give it a couple more minutes here. I see some folks are uh, um, haven't fully checked in yet. Probably wondering what you're looking at on your screen there. That's uh, just my own personal tracker. Uh, probably the most important piece up there for you is uh, my student contact. Um, I look and see when the students come online. And then at the end of the uh, set, I also have a, a printout of, of who was online during the course. This is how I keep track of your attendance. And the other blocks you're seeing over to the right, uh, uh, that helps me just keep track uh, of what I've seen of your work as we go through the class. So if you look over there and you see MBP1, that just means I went on to the tracker today and looked at the uh, um, MVPs that have been posted up there. So for Team Ham, you don't have anything posted, so I wasn't able to look at your uh, your project. Uh, maybe you have a classified project or something, but uh, hopefully you, you'll be able to tell me a little bit about it. For the other teams, though, I was able to read up on what your project was about. I can see where you're at. And more importantly, is I can see how benchmarking and secondary research is going to help you uh, in your projects. And then you'll see next to it where it says agree on week one. That's just that three-question um, commitment to um, school policy for plagiarism. And yeah, everybody needs to go and go and finish that up. So before I get going here, let's see. Oh, I see Judith. I see you're online now. Yes, sir. Jay, are you here? I don't see him yet. Uh, I understand Matthew's uh, hearing impaired. I see you online, Matthew. And I know that uh, we're going to have to work something out, like get this immediately over to Google for translation, which we'll do right after the class. And then uh, how about um, Danielle James? Yep, I'm here. Oh, there you are. I see you now. Okay, so it looks like we just are missing Jay, and that's it. All right. I see Matt wrote back. Let me shoot him a note back. All right, so you, you may see this dashboard um, at various times. And again, it's, uh, I, at the beginning of each class, I'll have this open. And I'm just tracking through what uh, um, your attendance, and you'll see everything plugging in. Once I get all these blocks to a green, our course is done. And for me, I'm a visual kind of person. You know, you look at your, your syllabus, and then you got to break it down to one stuff's due, what's the assignments. And this just lets me have one, one um one sheet I can look at and see everything that's required for this course. It also helps me if uh, you're reaching out to me individually. I, I don't have to dig deep into the uh, NGS uh, 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 portal to, to see where you stand and something. I can just open this up. In fact, I, you know, I teach uh, for a living. So um, I, I teach maybe 30 hours a week at uh, for the Navy, and then I teach at another school as well. So over the course of our time together, I'll, I'll have contact with about um, 100 uh, students. So, so this is how I keep track of you. I'm going to open up the uh, uh, NGS portal. And I'll just start there before we get into our, our lesson. And uh, I teach about four classes a year with NGS. So I've had a a good five month break here from, from the school. Now when I've come back, they've changed their um, um, their portal and, and how you're doing it. And I understand that this cohort 
has also had a change uh, midstream. Is that correct? Uh, change how? Yeah, you probably started where uh, you, you you had a different look to your portal. You didn't have news and announcements and overview. Um, everything is tracked now. In fact, I'm in the student mode. So before we had a communications section and then you'd come on and do all your discussions in there and you drop things into the Dropbox. But now they've added on um, this coursework section. So maybe you've been doing this all along and, and it's it's not new to you. Just know that this is new to me. So um, I've opened up all, um, all five weeks of, of deliverables here. So you can look at them. I'm not gonna hold anything back. So you, know, you, can, you can move ahead on things. All your, all your uh, deliverable due dates are here as well. Um, the good news for you with benchmarking is uh, it, it needs to occur about this point in your master's program because you need to have some uh, lean knowledge to do some of the benchmarking work, yet you should be far enough in your projects that we can't make you go out and do a benchmark right now. Benchmarking can take anywhere uh, from four to six months to accomplish. So, so they stuck it here because you know we're gonna we're going to simulate a benchmark case because you'll have a case study, and we'll we'll talk more about that uh, uh, as the evening goes on. And we use a two-week case study to help you understand all the benchmarking principles. But you don't actually perform a benchmark. But at the same time, if you're going to be a quality systems master, you really need to know what a benchmark is, and you need to know um, uh, the process. And then, as importantly, you're going to do some secondary research or secondary benchmarking. We'll talk more about that tonight. Uh, two, are, two very easy concepts. We're going to look at a lot of different models of benchmarking, how you go about getting it done. We're going to apply at least one of those models to our case study. And then we're going to look for some best practices that, that could help you in your own MVP. And you'll walk away from this course with uh, a, a at least a couple of slides from the whole course on on secondary research that will help you in your future state with your MVP project. So as we go, as I turtle along here, uh, just a few questions, just break in and 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 say your question. Um, for me, it's hard to read the the chat at the same time it's going. I look at it periodically, um, so it's really best if you if you just say something and I'll I'll stop and and. Uh, answer your question. All right, so here we are. We're, we're in the NGS portal. We're looking at uh, the coursework, which is where you're going to do most of your work. This week, it, I don't know why it's, it's, uh, it came out this week with one week one at the bottom, then it goes two, three, four, five. I can't explain why it does it. But um, for this week, you have two discussion, uh, discussion questions that are due. And then um, you have two other assignments that we're assigning out now, but they're not due for um, uh, another week for for one of them, which is your secondary plan. You'll see that in our, our notes tonight. And then another one um, that's not due until until week three. And you'll see that as we go. So let's go look at the syllabus. Actually, before we do the syllabus, I want to look at some course materials for you here. So I've added some course materials in here. So just know we have a, a two-part Almar case study. I only release part one right now because it's an individual effort. So when you get this case study, you'll be asked some questions to solve by yourself based on the um, uh, the lecture tonight and the lecture next week. Then you answer the questions for the case study. Then I release part two. And I do that because I answer most of the questions in part two. So I can't release it to you right now. Then we get part two. We, we work as a team uh, to look at some um, um, analytics that that might make that company perform better more to follow and all that but just know right now you only see part one on the uh, uh, on the materials then we have some other stuff here that could help you you know you're gonna you're gonna develop some uh, quantitative and qualitative questions you'll need them for your survey you'll see as uh, as that assignment comes out and this shows you how to do it I've uh, put out maybe a hundred different types of ways to ask a question here and then uh, trying to get you to understand the difference between variables that we measure, all, all coming to you in this course. Um, 
And then you have a couple of uh, bibliography templates. You'll get to choose which one you want. One's either just a plain old template format you fill in the square, um, or the other one's an APA style paper. And when you get that assignment, uh, we'll go. We'll come back to these templates and look at them in detail at that time. All right, so we'll go to the syllabus now. Hopefully everybody's just printed it out. Uh, the course follows the syllabus. I follow the syllabus. In fact, I wrote this course. So um, this will be my, I don't know, maybe maybe 15th time teaching this course over the years. Um, you know, we've got it down uh, in a pretty lean manner. But all the materials that are here, you need. So the case studies will be up there in the um, in the course materials as we go, but you need to acquire these other these other case studies. So you'll see fast cycle benchmarking, creative benchmarking, and Integron. You should have a textbook too, which is Watson. Watson 2007. So I rewrote this course last year, and I tried to find a more current uh, uh, benchmarking book, and I did, um, but it just wasn't as good as Watson. So hopefully you bought it. It's something that should be in your professional library. If you're ever asked to benchmark, this is a good way to uh, um, uh, to academically bound your study if you have to do this for your work. The assignments you'll see uh, in the coursework, uh, here's their weighting. Um, you'll see everything. It looks like it's on a 100-point scale, but this is the weight that they get when the, uh, when the computer does the um, calculations for what everything's worth. So you have some uh, assignments. Um, our first assignment, and you'll see it in the material as we go through it for all the assignments, but you'll see at the end of today, we're going to talk about team assignment one. As a team, you're going to determine what your secondary benchmarking plan is. It's worth 10%. We'll talk more about that as we as we get to that slide later tonight, and it's, but it's not due to week, week three. Then you have a individual secondary benchmarking plan, um, which is due by week four, and these are the things that will go into them. There's a template for you to use, and we'll cover all that when we get to it. Then we have a third one, which is the, the case study, where 20% of your course is the first week is an individual um, effort. You'll read the case study. You'll answer these six questions. The following week, we'll do part two, again, worth 20%. So, you know, 40% of this course's uh, weighting is on these two case st studies. So this, this is how we achieve you getting to know what a primary be benchmarking is about. And again, as a team, you'll, you'll, you'll produce some slides and you'll give a presentation. And uh, more to follow as we, we get towards week three when we assign this. And then you have a final uh, presentation, team assignment five. So out of the whole course, you're going to be looking for, um, namely, uh, our secondary research. Everybody's going to be looking at their project and for things that, uh, that could be creatively helpful to you uh, improve your process. And uh, you'll present it in a presentation uh, at week five. And then everything that happens by week is how I, I go about um, uh, delivering each class to you. Any questions so far? If not, I'm going to shut down the syllabus and uh, we'll move on to uh, onto the lesson. All right, um, so before we get going, uh, I'd like to hear from you for a minute. Uh, and maybe one, one speaker from each team, give me your one minute uh, uh, elevator speech on what your project is about. And uh, it doesn't matter which team starts, but someone would be brave and be the first to go, that'd be swell. Thanks, Edgar. I can talk to you about Team UTC. Thanks, Edgar. 
so basically, uh, our team is comprised of Cameron Helland and myself. Our project is to improve the first pass yield or FPY of a certain cell that we work in. Um, it has a certain metric or percentage that has not been met, and this is due to various um, uh, rejections in the process. Uh, so, in a just that's pretty much what we're working to better to pretty much meet or exceed the um, established goal uh, that has not been met since the beginning of of this year. Do you know what sigma rating you're at right now? Uh, to be honest, no. All right. Okay. So, do you know what percentage you're trying you're at and what percentage you're trying to move to? Oh. Yes. Uh, so the the established goal is 98.8 percent, and we are currently within two percentage points under that. Did you say you're at 98.8? Uh, yeah. So 98.8 is the goal, uh, but we are averaging between 96 and 98.2. Oh, wow, you got a true Six Sigma project. Uh, very neat. Uh, I've worked with a lot of UTC uh, classes in the past. Uh, who's your Who's your senior champion? Uh, Mark Posada. He's our general manager for the department. Oh yeah, isn't he a former student here too? Yes, he actually he and pretty much our supervisors and other managers from the plant have gone through this. I want to say last year. That's right. I remember, Mark. You tell him I said hi, all right? Well, do. I think he went through this course with me, as a matter of fact. Either that or finance. I forget which one. All right. Um, also, is it possible for me to see your um, your MVP? Like I said, it wasn't posted online when I went on there today. Uh, yeah, Cameron and I actually wanted to talk to you about that after class. Um, we were actually trying to get Mark to sign off on our uh, on our charter, but because he's been a um, it's been kind of sporadic at work, uh, also with our champion uh, going on business travel. Um, but uh, I'd like Cameron to know if he could upload it, and I think, uh, I don't know if he has it, but we are planning to upload it before we leave class tonight. Oh, sounds good. All right. All right. I'll, I'll stand by at the end of class. We can talk more about it. All right. Thanks, Edgar. Okay. How about Team Prime? Hello. Hello. Hey, hi. how you doing? This is Jay. Hey, Jay. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. Doing good. Uh, Team Prime. Well, our our uh, master business project is uh is concerning the ongoing problem that the military is having with parts, aircraft parts. And basically, we were trying. What we're trying to do is uh, I, I guess lean out or streamline uh, the ordering process. For our project, uh, we're concentrating on the downtime that our aircraft goes through waiting on parts to come in. Okay, I uh, I read your uh, your MVP. It's very interesting to me. Uh, I happen to have a son-in-law that's in the Air Force. He's a uh, supply guy for F-22s and uh, he, okay. he laments all the time about moving parts around the Air Force and, and how how much uh, inefficiency there is, and especially in the tracking of the part. I also read too that the uh, it, that uh, in this case for your project that it's a search and rescue aircraft. Yes, so it's a C-130, yes, sir. Yeah, I you know, and there should be no downtime on a search and rescue aircraft. Um, <laughs> most of my time on and in emergency operations centers with the Coast Guard. And you know, we have by law we have to be able to launch within. Um, you know, 25 minutes of receiving a search and rescue case. So, you know, there's there's no excuse for our stuff to be down, but uh, we will use four aircraft to make one, if that makes sense. So yes, our flight line has four on there and one of them is going to work and it's going to be up. So, so you have some interesting, you have a very interesting project. Uh, just know you have a instructor that's, that's geared logistically and uh, knows quite a bit about uh, readiness requirements. So you have access to me this month uh, to talk about your stuff, especially as we start looking for the metrics or looking sure, for your be, thing. I can think of a lot of things that will help you guys out. So it's going to be a good. That'll be a big help to us. Good one. So, 
we, we've got a lot of hurdles because a lot of our parts are owned by the vendors via contract. So they control when we get them, how we get them, and if we get them. Yeah, those doggone contractors. All right, all right. Thanks for the for the brief, and then let's go with the last team. Yep. So this is Dave Garkey. Um, team variation. Um, ours is actually a first pass yield case um, based on um, spring load of a seal. It's an aircraft engine seal, and um, it has to meet a certain spring load um, to hold pressure on uh, another part inside the engine. So um, we currently have um pretty poor first pass yield on that so um our project is to uh go through and find the variation in the process and then uh hopefully bring the first pass yield up very good boy yeah, another six sigma project for sure for you um it may be for uh team prime you're probably more of a lean project but uh you know certainly you can get some measurements well exciting for you guys um I also note that Team Prime has a pretty large team. Uh, Ernie had sent me a note talking about what happened and how it ended up being such a big team. I kind of feel for you guys. Um, um, you got to find a way to make sure that everybody uh, is engaged and, and contributing. We'll talk about that as we, we go through some of our assignments here. Um, anyway, all right, thanks for the briefs on your uh, – on your projects, let's look what we're going to do for the for the next five sessions. So I don't know if you noticed or not. When I had the my tracker up, it was showing it's a 33 days from uh, now to the end. That's uh, kind of like fake news, though. Um, so if 33 days is the day that we shut down and turn in the grades, your your actual last presentation is on the on the first of November. So you really only have I think like 28 days. Um, to absorb this material and make it into something useful. The, um, the good news for this, even though it looks a little time crunched, is um, it, this isn't brain intensive. It requires some critical thinking, but it's, I'm not going to crush your brains with uh, Taguchi statistics in this class. You know, we're going to talk about um, some qualitative and quantitative questionnaires and, and how, to, how to set the stage to go out and do a benchmark. But um, everything we do in here is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, all you need to have to pass this course really is to be present. Not physically, but when you start uh, listening to this stuff, is, is try not to have any distractions so you can get through it on your first pass. Nothing worse than having to go back and listen to me uh, do a lecture twice. All right, so, so here we are. Lesson one, introduction to benchmarking. So what's our course outcome? I want to understand what benchmarking uh, as a key organizational process uh, improvement tool and the approach that we use. I want to be able to integrate the benchmarking with other quality improvement approaches. They're already there for you. I, in the two that I saw, you have all your DMAIC markers down. And uh, you'll see how this all integrates here before we're done tonight. All right, so we want you to be able to develop primary and secondary research plans. This one befuddles students sometimes, the word primary and secondary. We'll see it a couple times tonight, but you have to understand the difference between the two types of researches and uh, what it means to you in the, in the quality world. All right, uh, then you have to demonstrate some skills in conducting secondary research and applying findings to your MVP. That's certainly your deliverable uh, at week five. So you'll give me some PowerPoint slides uh, with your secondary research findings. All right, we've done a syllabus review. I wanted to show it to you. Does anybody have a question on the syllabus? If you follow that thing exactly, you're going to be in good shape for this course. Then if you go on and look at the coursework, everything has a deliverable due date on there. Again, if you deliver on the due date, it won't. It's just it's just an easy peasy course. All right, so here's what we're we're going to get through on our five lessons here. So tonight we're going to talk about the you know, process of benchmarking. We're going to talk about the types of benchmarking. We're going to look at the NGS model and other people's models. Um, then we're going to look at how it links to Six Sigma and then what secondary benchmarking is. All right. So tonight's a, really a meat and potatoes night. It's the it's the vocabulary of of benchmarking. Next week we're going to develop a secondary benchmarking plan. 
talk about library and electronic resources. And hopefully your takeaway from that is that uh, when you're done with this course, you'll have uh, access outside of NGS on databases that you'll be able to use for years to come. Then I'll introduce you into survey in uh, instruments as well. That's the questionnaires. Then we'll deal with the uh, benchmarking case study part one. In week three, we're going to look at uh, the code of conduct, and then we're going to um, quiz out a little bit in the classroom and see uh, with, with some ethical and integrity questions on where you think it fits in, in the code of conduct. Kind of a fun thing to do. We're going to talk about creative benchmarking. It's one of your uh, Harvard Business Review case studies. It's kind of a neat, uh, short little um, product that helps you to think outside the box when you're going out to look for research ideas. And then we're going to talk about planning the benchmark, which is something you have to um, demonstrate by using it in the case study part two. More to follow on that. Then in week four, you're going to present uh, Alamar Paint Company findings. So you'll do a short presentation on that. And that will demonstrate your knowledge of primary benchmarking. And then we're going to complete your secondary benchmarking, the things that are going to go into your um, into your presentations. And then the following week, you'll have one. This is your last week. Well, the very last Thursday, we, we open the floor with you. You do your final presentations. And that will conclude the course. So uh, before we get going on on the uh, vocabulary and the and the history and background of uh, benchmarking, uh, do I have any um, benchmarkers here? Any lean Six Sigma folks that have done bench benchmarking? Okay, all right, all right that's okay. Um, you'll certainly have a good grasp of it by the time we're done here. Uh, I'm a benchmarker. I've done it uh, a few times in my, my personal work uh, when I was in the Coast Guard. I'm going to tell you about one of them right now but just because I'm going to offer it as some examples as we, as we continue in this, in this course. Is, um, after, in the early 2000s, you know, we were wondering in the Coast Guard if our, if our mathematics for search and rescue were correct. The idea here is you know, a lot of math goes into figuring out where a person is going to drift in the water. So if you have a person fall over their boat and we want to know where they're going to be in one hour, we can apply some mathematics to it. How about six hours? How about 12, 24, 72? So we have a mathematical model that does that. And uh, my job at the time, I was the director of an emergency operations center, and it was to assign out the search tracks uh, to our search resources. So, so I was pretty involved in the, in the mathematical end of it, and I was picked to be part of a benchmarking team. Um, at first, I thought, oh, good, good grief, i got to go do this, until we decided where we were going to go. We ended up going into uh, – we started in, in Halifax, Canada, and looked at their search and rescue. And then we went to London, and then we went to Germany, we went to the Netherlands, we went to Finland, and then we went to uh, Hong Kong and uh, compared our model against all theirs. And along the way, um, we got to see how each of the countries went about search and rescues. And that led us into what's called secondary research. And I'll talk more about that as we get going. But I want to set the stage for you because I'm going to use that, um, that uh, extensive benchmark as we start talking about the types of benchmarking as we go through uh, uh, the next two weeks. All right, so what, what do we, what's the purpose of benchmarking? You know, we use it to improve an organization's performance, either at the strategic, which is the enterprise, that's the executives, the executive level, or at the tactical operation level, which is where most of us work. All right, so you have, you have two types of benchmarking. You have strategic and you have operational. All right, so we use benchmarking, uh, can be used as a standalone method or in conjunction with other improvement methodologies like Lean, Six Sigma, Kaizen, PDCA, and I don't know why this slide doesn't have it, but the biggest one of all for our master's students is the DMAIC model. All of you are neck deep into, into it. 
benchmarking is absolutely married up with the DMAIC model. And I'll show you that later in a slide. All right, so, you know, for you, your, your own project, you'll, you're just going to integrate stuff from this class into your DMAIC model. You, you won't recognize it as benchmarking, but those tools are there. However, when you're in a company, uh, sometimes, you know, you're asked to be on a benchmark. The company wants to improve itself, and they charter a benchmark for a, a given time frame on a given subject, and, and you will use Lean and Six Sigma tools within your benchmarking project. Here at NGS, it's the other way around. We have you in the tool already, and we're asking you to incorporate what you find from this course within the tools you've already learned. Chris. Yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah, I got a question. I know uh, from reading this and looking at it, I know in the military we have a process or something that's similar to us, but we we call it best practices. Is that the same thing? Best practices are secondary research. So, oh, okay. so benchmarking is primary research. Secondary research is best practice. And we're going to dig into that here in a few slides. Gotcha. All right. All right, so the idea with benchmarking is that you own what you own. You know your world. You know, um, it's not going to get any better because if you're not, you, know, you only know what you can do with the product you have. You read the manuals. You're, the machine's delivering what it's going to deliver or the process is working like it's going to work. And that's how it's been set up. That's the way it is. So, so you're kind of stuck. You know, you can't, you're done looking inside for improvements. Yeah, you might be able to tweak a thing or two, but maybe the whole thing is wrong and you need to look somewhere else. So I like the little Einstein quote in this box here. We, you know, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created the problem. Yeah, so, but anyway, you know, we, the idea is that our process isn't working. All of you in your projects have an as-is state, whether it's a bad first pass yield or um, our parts that, that, aren't getting delivered in time. So we know we have something that's not right. Um, we've tried to solve it on our own. Now we need to go outside of our own little network and see if we can find other ways to, to, to make it better. So the idea here is that we're gonna be looking at somebody else's work. Doesn't mean we're stealing the work. You know, we're just gonna go out and we're gonna try and figure out what this other person or organization or uh, work environment is doing better than our environment. So the you know the whole funny thing in the middle is why reinvent the wheel when when the wheel is there and it's working. Well, your wheel isn't working. You got the square wheel on the right, and we want to have the round wheel on the left there. And uh, we have to we have to figure out who to look at and uh, what we would expect to get from them if we invest time and money to do a benchmark. Because anytime we go and do these things, it costs time. That's the number one thing is you got to put a team together. It's usually three, four people, and uh, you might need a travel budget. You may need to be, buy some product, but you know, the biggest cost in benchmarking usually comes to the people that have to perform the benchmark and uh, go out and do it. So they're, you know, time isn't cheap. All right, so here's reasons organizations do benchmarking. All right, so we want to determine the relative position of your organization. And that's what we were doing in the Coast Guard. We were trying to figure out where does United States search and rescue mathematics fit in the world. All right, and we wanted to know, uh, did we need to improve it? Were we the best? What, what could we learn by benchmarking it against others? Uh, maybe we can make a, a better model that gets us uh, to find the person in the water quicker or more accurately. All right, so you want to deliver, you know, the reasons we do this, determine our relative position to the marketplace or to competitors. When we did the uh, search and rescue, it wasn't about competition. It's just where we were. You know, is there something better out there? All right, so we want to know where we're within the search and rescue industry. All right, so it also provides inputs to the strategic planning process. Kind of a big word, strategic planning process. But every time I read the word strategic, I just put the word executive in there because that's where a strategic vision comes from. So it's your folks that are at the director level and higher who are, are trying to plan stuff out. And you're providing them a SWOT, 
Uh, I haven't seen any SWATs in any of the uh, uh, two presentations I've seen, but it's the strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats to, to an organization. And then uh, targets for goals. And we'll talk more about KPIs. Hopefully you've had KPI by this time, which is your key performance indicator. And uh, we'll talk about how important those are in benchmarking as we get into data analytics a little bit later in the course. All right, so another reason for doing benchmarking is to improve our performance measurement system. All right, maybe we're looking at our own product incorrectly. And we maybe someone else is measuring their product in a different way uh, than we do uh, and able to uh, get better use of their machines, a uh, higher sales rate, uh, simply by um, looking at the numbers from a different angle. Of course, uh, we're going to establish uh, metrics to go along with all that business. All right, we also do it to uh, to improve processes, incorporate be uh, best practices. So that's that's just what we were talking about a minute ago, incorporating best practices. So so when I was on my search and rescue uh, benchmark, I, I was out there looking at mathematical models. Um, but as we we were in Sweden, looking at their uh, at their rescue coordination center and their mathematics. Uh, we were actually on the rescue floor, and a call had come in on the radio. And the call um, was a mayday call that was coming in from C. And uh, the guy calmly, in his IKEA furniture, he, he went to his telephone, and he hit three numbers, pound 39 or something like that. And that pound 39 triggered his digital recorder to rewind the last 15 seconds of tape in this case, digital, and play back what it heard. Instantaneously, he hit pound 39, and it just played the last 15 seconds of recorded uh, uh, radios. In the United States, at that same time, if I was in my rescue center, and that call came in, and it said, mayday, mayday, and maybe it gave you like a name, like blah, 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 and I couldn't understand what that name said, I would have to get up from my chair. I'd have to walk to a back room. I'd have to stop the tape, the analog tape, and I would have to hand rewind it back counterclockwise about 15 seconds. I don't know, maybe that's 15 inches of tape. And then I'd have to listen to it again. And then I'd have to rewind it again and listen to it again. And then I'd walk back to my chair. Total lapse time could be as much as five minutes. Well, I'm gone from my chair, I can't listen to the radios. Right? And I can't be launching a rescue asset. So I just described to you a best practice. All right, so I wasn't even on that mission. My mission was to discover the mathematics for search and rescue. Are we good or not? And then along the way, I discovered something almost as important, the ability to play back tapes digitally with your telephone at your desk. And from there, we went ahead and recommended as a best practice, along with our benchmark, uh, that the Coast Guard should incorporate this digital playback, which they did. Cost a ton of money, but it saves a ton of time. And who knows, maybe in the end it saves a life because you can launch somebody as much as three or four minutes earlier than you would have otherwise launched them. And when you're sitting around in 40 degree water waiting for someone to pick you up, that might be all the difference in the world. So that's what secondary benchmarking is. Primary is what your mission's all about. Secondary is what you find along your journey. And, uh, and that one we accidentally found. In your case, we're not doing anything accidentally. We're going to do a deliberate secondary search. So you're going to be looking for best in practice, but along the way, you're going to be looking for other key indicators that makes them best in class that might also make you best in class. We'll talk more about that as we get into the slides a little deeper. All right, we also benchmark to learn from other people's mistakes and avoid pitfalls. You know, those are case studies. We want to understand what went wrong for them and not have it happen to us. All right. Sometimes we also use it to expose leaders and workforce to, to new ideas and to, to inspire. Certainly when I became a, a, at the executive level, I would benchmark trying to bring up my, my mid-grade managers into senior managers. and We'd use benchmarking as a, as a teaching tool. All right. What this slide represents is a, an organization that is looking for the best in class. 
you see this uh, up on the angle, it says world-class leadership. All right, so when you go out to benchmark, everything you do should be to get your process better. Um, but some people, you know, they can take this to a point where it says, I want to be the best in the world, and I'm willing to, I'm willing to put the money into it, and I want to be the absolute best retailer in the world. Perhaps you're your target and you want to overtake Walmart and you go all in for your your benchmark and you're going to study everything about Walmart there is from their meat tray packing down to uh, the salaries they're playing, paying their employees and trying to see if you can call some kind of difference out of the way they do business with the way um, Target's doing business and then incorporate those changes into the organization to become um, the the world-class leader. So if you look across the continuum on the on the bottom, when I benchmark, when I benchmark, I'm usually somewhere in one and two. If I'm doing an internal benchmark, which I'll describe later, I could be at number three, looking inside my own organization. Ideally, I want to beat the industry standards, especially if I'm running a P, uh, profit and loss uh, uh, statements, I could be over in number four. Or simply, if you're trying to be the best, and the, and the Coast Guard was, we wanted the best model, I'm trying to be best in class. And then we found out that we were actually um, at number six with uh, worldwide leadership on our model. So those are the different levels of benchmarking. You know, we're not out to solve world peace with every benchmark. Um, sometimes we're, we're, we're just trying to solve a local problem and you'll see that when we get to Almar Paint. These guys, they make paint, but they don't do a very good job. And we're going to help them get better. So they're not necessarily, they want to be a national leader. They just want to stop having mistakes. All right, here's another way to look at uh, continuous improvement and um, benchmarking, what's happening here. So you see where the dot, the dashed lines are upward. What they're saying is if you took those dashed lines out, and you work continuous improvement in your organization, that's all you did, you would just be that uh, kind of gold line going up. But if you take benchmarking at some point and you look externally for a better process, this is what it's going to do to your continuous improvement. You're going to uh, have a breakthrough. At some point, you're going to realize, okay, I've leaned out my system as far as I can. And I've used Six Sigma to prove that my system is at its limit. I'm I'm performing in my system at maybe a, a Sigma 4. That'd be nice. 4.5, great. But if I do this benchmarking thing and I change my whole process, maybe I can take my Sigma up to a 5.5. A five. Or who knows? It'd be nice to see a 6.0. Not that I know any that's like that. But uh, the idea is that you're using someone else's uh, story, someone else's process, someone else's um, leadership ideas to change your your process and uh, elevate your continuous improvement uh, uh, timeline. Kind of a nice slide. All right, so why do we benchmark? Uh, besides all the things I've already told you, it gives us a better awareness of ourselves. I've seen benchmarkers that don't know their own process, but they're out benchmarking. It's the goofiest thing. You know, I see where, like, um, well, I'm a senior manager, therefore I must know how everything works. But they don't know how it works. The best benchmarkers are the people who work uh, with the equipment, the people who understand the process and the pain. You have to understand the pain to be able to get, be a good benchmarker. So if you don't, you'll just skim right over it and not, uh, and not respect that if you can change the level of pain that people go through, you can have a breakthrough in that all by itself. So it's a better awareness of our own process, ourselves. And then we have a better awareness how people other than us are doing the same process. All right, so benchmarking versus benchmarks. All right, so everybody's, everybody's probably heard of a benchmark. So a benchmark is like your computer. If you've got the... If you have the Intel A5 chip in your computer, well, that's a benchmark chip. It, it performs at a certain clock speed, at a certain temperature, and 
if you had the A7, it will perform at a, yet another frequency and a different temperature, yet one's faster than the other. So a benchmark is really a, um, a performance indicator of a technical piece of the pie. Whereas you have benchmarking. Benchmarking is to look at the whole, the whole process, not just the chip, but you're looking at the line. You're looking at the people. You're looking at the training. You're looking at uh, anything that another company is willing to share with you uh, on how their process, product, procurement, um, manufacturing works. And the idea is then to use that in your organization with your methodology, but slightly adapted. So you're not stealing. It's not what we're talking about in benchmarking. It's modifying other people's processes, though, uh, to make yours more streamlined. As we uh, look further in the slides, you're going to see many models for benchmarking. Uh, many ways to go about this business. So benchmarking is the process, and that's what this course is about. We're going to talk about the process. Benchmarks are simply analytics. All right. There could have been a better slide here. All right, but here's the background for benchmarking. So the idea is that a cobbler who makes shoes would put your foot up on a bench and then we would outline the, the shoe and that would be the benchmark pattern for your shoes. Um, I used to have a slide in there, I don't know why it got changed, but uh, Robert Camp is the founder of benchmarking. And he's and it's, and it's in the late 70s, uh, I'll take that back, more like the early 70s. He is the guy, and if you look in your Watson book, there's a whole section in the back that talks about Xerox and Canon. He was at Xerox, and uh, the idea with Xerox is they saw uh, their their printers as a guy that comes with the machine to, for the maintenance. And you never really own the thing. It's expensive, and you had a tech that would come out and do the repairs for you. And it was a very expensive thing. And then all of a sudden, Canon started blowing the socks off of, uh, of Xerox with these throwaway machines. So what Robert Camp did, he worked at Xerox, is he simply bought a Canon printer and reverse engineered it. What he discovered was that the Canon was using uh, throwaway products. They're using, instead of, um, instead of steel cases, uh, and instead of using steel um, parts within the, within the machine itself, Canon was primarily using plastic parts. And their whole business paradigm was different. The idea was to drive down the price of a printer to the point where with that one it broke, it was okay to throw it away. And that was never in Xerox's uh, wheelhouse. But anyway, they did the benchmark and they found that either to, to retain a share of the printer pro uh, market, they were gonna have to change their, their process and their way they do business. No more do you go out and buy a Xerox uh, printer that would have a person come with it. Um, you know, everybody has the, the mindset that, okay, these things are gonna last about a year and then we're gonna throw it away and get a new one. That's where the market went. So this, this kind of, you know, Duran, he's our, he's our uh, Demag daddy there, our, our World War II Toyota production system guy who uh, helped figure out TQM and quality management systems. Uh, he's saying that, you know, benchmarking is a significant te uh, technique to be used in a competitive environment. I described that to you uh, with Camp when he did the Xerox and, and uh, and Canon benchmark absolutely is about competition, but you know, I'm you know, people aren't going to open their doors to you either. And, you know, that's those are their trade secrets. They don't want to come in and show everything, but there, there's nothing wrong with buying the product and seeing what it, how it came out, and what it made it so well. So we'll be talking about the ethics and integrity of benchmarking from afar. You're doing a competitive benchmark where the person doesn't let you in, but how can you as an observer uh, get to the core of what they're doing that could lead to uh, a better product for you? More to follow on that. All right, so, so what are we looking for in benchmarking? 
first of all, we know we're going to have a team, and we're going to go target some other people. We'll talk about how to target people and what that might look like. As we're looking at um, what to do, we're looking for what's in our process that we could we could do better. So that's our process. In this next part, you see and best practices. So and best practices are things that are on the side. It's not necessarily your process directly, but it could be a sub part of the process where they found a, a new supplier that brings them instead of the metal part, they bring them a plastic part at one tenth the cost. So you find that they have a best practice over there. Or you might have had, um, you might have a similar process to another company. You have 10 people to do your process and they only have three. Well, how do they do that? All right, so you're trying to discover, you know, what their, how, in other words, their process is the same as yours, but they have something in there that makes it a best practice. Maybe that best practice is when we start using the five whys. Why can they, why do they only have four people doing it instead of our 10? All right, well, where are they at? So you, you, sort of, you start breaking it down and you, in, after you get through um, a couple levels, you find out that their company hires from the local community college. And meanwhile, our company only hires from Craigslist, and we only we don't get people with the um, that want to stay with the company more than six months. So, so, so benchmarking can lead you down a strange road sometimes. What seems like a best practice is really sometimes the environment for which the pra uh, the improvement is embedded. I'll talk more about that in, uh, next week. But anyway, as we start our benchmarking, we're looking for enablers um, that are going to make a substantial improvement in performance. It's the thing. We're looking for, you know, what what makes your study uh, the bomb. And uh, for me, you know, the math wasn't it. I went out to benchmark math and found out we were, we were good to go. So I didn't come back with a win, but I came back with a best practice that was a huge win. So the enabler wasn't, you know, uh, I was out benchmarking mathematics, but within the whole process, they got to launch the plane. They got to hear the recording. So we looked at the whole process. So what I benchmarked, I ended up benchmarking all of search and rescue from start to finish. And with this really neat enabler on how to speed up the process of, uh, of determining if you have a distress call or not. All right. So when we, when we get these great enablers, we want to adapt them into our process and management approach, uh, approaches. All right, someone give me a sound check. Make sure I haven't uh, dropped off line here. And, and... Good to go, sir. All right, thank you, ma'am. All right, so more in the definitions of benchmarks. All right, so benchmarks, a standard of excellent or achievement against which other products or services can be measured and compared. It's simply you have to have two like uh, organizations to have an actual benchmark. We don't, we don't compare apples to oranges. Uh, I'll talk more about that later. There are times that we will look at um, an orange to see if it'll make the apples process better, but that's not a, that's not a, a benchmark in its traditional sense. All right, so benchmarks can be used to spur exploration and to reasons for differences, to motivate planning and implementation of changes, and to seek continuous improvement. So it sounds like the DMAIC model. If you just, uh, if you're, if you are a QA person, you either live in the the DMAIC model or the PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act model. All right. So the models we're going to show you here in just a little bit are the, uh, they're more involved for benchmarking. You know, it doesn't rattle off your tongue like DMAIC because there's like 14 steps in it. Um, but it's models that can be used to do a uh, farm to soup ingredient list of what you have to do to complete your benchmark. All right, typically there's not one benchmark, and uh, there isn't. You know, you're, you're gonna take the benchmarks that we show you, and if you become a benchmarker later, you would just adapt what NGS has or, or one of the other ones that we show you here and make it work for your environment. All right. So, what we're really wanting to get out of any benchmark is to get some meaningful and comparative data. All right, so there's two types of data, and I'll talk great detail about that in in uh, week three. 
but you know we're looking for qualitative and quantitative data. All right, this is probably the most important slide of the night. Um, there's two types of benchmarking. There's primary benchmarking and secondary benchmarking. All right, so whenever you hear the word benchmarking all by itself, think about primary benchmarking. This primary benchmarking is the comparison of one or more of an organization's processes directly with another organization. That is primary benchmarking. Now this next one, these next two, these next words here, secondary benchmarking, it, it is said many different ways. It's either secondary benchmarking, it's a best practice, or secondary research. You'll hear all those terms used for this same definition here. It's an information about a best practice obtained through review of literature, online research, database search, or use of third-party resources. Again, you really need to understand what this secondary benchmarking is. Sometimes, and if you go, if you are one of these people who goes on for your doctorate degree, you will use a literature review. Literature review is the same thing as a secondary benchmark. So in this, uh, in this secondary benchmark, what you're doing is you will do that before you do your primary benchmarking. So, so when I set out to go do my benchmark about the mathematics for search and rescue, I knew that we were going to go to these other countries. So before we went there, we had to have game. That game came in the sense of what kind of questions would I ask them? How would I score the questions? I, um, I needed to be as inclusive up front of what I needed to do while I was in these organizations because I'm not going back. You know, you're using other people's time, plus it costs a lot of money to, to, to do this traveling. So as you go in to do a primary benchmark, you don't want to go uh, from place to place and change your uh, method of the comparison because you're changing too many variables and your outcome may not look well. So what we do in secondary benchmarking, that is all the research necessary to conduct your primary benchmarking. This is the backbone behind it. You're, you're out there looking for, and, so, and secondary benchmarking is what will tell you who you need to primary benchmark against. You may think it's one company, but after you get on and start doing some research, you find another company that does it even better than the one that you thought was the best. So what secondary benchmarking is doing is helping you to define who the best in class is, or the best in the world is, or the best spring builder in the world. You know, maybe you, you know, if your your company's looking, um, you could be. Uh, so it's aircraft springs, but perhaps you're going to look at Smith and Wesson and their springs. That's 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 where secondary benchmarking will take you. And we'll talk more about that as we get going. Do I have any questions? Yes, sir. So, Go so ahead. This is Judith. With prime aircraft, when you're looking at the problem set that we have, and since this unit is quite unique in what they do, how would we proceed in making that comparison? If we compare like the aircrafts, like how a Boeing 757, 744, 747 works, what makes them the best aircrafts versus what we do, because when we're looking at transport and um, they they do rescue and transport, we don't per se take a commercial airline in going into a war zone. So we usually take the aircraft provided by the Air Force. So how do we find organizations to compare to? Or okay. do we try to compare internally? Okay, well, we'll get some slides on that a little bit later, but what you're you're asking not about the manufacturing, you're asking about how parts get from place to place, right? And how they get there quickly, is that correct? Yes, sir. The parts is the biggest issue, yes. Okay. And, the well, and this is within an Air Force organization, and this is for C-130s. Well, you know, you would be looking at, and you'll see this here in a minute, what would be called an internal benchmark. You Let's go look at, you know, what? how does a frontline fighter get its parts? You know, maybe you should be on that same track line. So you, you could be looking at someone else within the organization who gets products you know, much the same way you do, but how is it that they can have a ready bird all the time? Maybe maybe you're not even looking at aircraft. Look at a drone facility. You know, those guys have to have those drones ready to go. Maybe you don't even do that. 
it's, it's some there's other things you could do and you're going to see what's called a generic benchmark you know yeah you know, here it is our parts seem to be hung up but meanwhile if you go to kodiak alaska today and you go to the uh kentucky fried chicken there's one on that island that that place is in the middle of nowhere they never run out of chicken all right they have something going with their supply line and that's what you're you're really looking at here sometimes it isn't necessarily an exact process like i say we don't we don't want to we would never offer back that we need to be kentucky fried chicken but we need to get something out of there. What is it that they're doing? You know, they have this thing called Gold Streak. I happen to know this because I've worked on a project uh, that we were trying to get parts to ships faster in Alaska. And what we were finding was that they were pooling up their parts in um, Seattle and they use this thing called Gold Streak and they put it on Alaska Air and it flies straight up to Kodiak uh, at, at a very reasonable price. And that's how that place, how that chicken place gets their chicken. Meanwhile, I would pool my stuff in the same place in Seattle, and they send it to me on a barge a week or two later. So, and you know, I needed that stuff to make a ship work. So here I am on a on a government frontline ship waiting for a barge. Meanwhile, the people in town are eating chicken that came there on an airplane. Well, it, it, so we learned from that. So all I'm saying is, hang with me for a little while. You're going to see some other ways to look at other organizations. And, and maybe think a little creatively how you do it. There's ways to get with it with your own organizations. There's maybe people to look at outside your organization. But I'll tell you what, you won't know any of this until you start getting on Google, until you start getting on databases and start typing in some keyword searches to look for things that are going to make your, um, your, your secondary benchmarking lead to a benchmarking partner. Hope I answered your question here, but if you hang on for just a couple more minutes, you're going to see some some different things here. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. All right. This is another important slide here. All right. Not only are we going to tell you the difference between uh, primary and secondary benchmarking, but you know, for students, for you, you will do secondary research and incorporate those findings into your MPP. That's that's. This is the second most important slide here. So we're going to actually do some secondary research uh, geared for each of your product uh, projects. You'll see the template for it here in just a little bit, and I'll tell you how to go about that. And you know, you'll you'll be working on that throughout this course. All right. So students are required to know the techniques of primary. And that's what I'm teaching you right now. The techniques right now is just the vocabulary. Next week I'll be more um, more detail oriented. But uh, you'll, you'll know the techniques of a primary benchmark and be able to develop a primary benchmarking plan, but you're not required to execute a primary benchmark for this course. So that's an important disclaimer. Uh, we're going to do some secondary. And well, I think why we have this slide here is that some people when they're done with the course say, oh, yeah, I benchmarked. You will not have benchmarked in this course. Yeah, you'll have done a DeMake model. You will fed it with your secondary research, but you will not do benchmarking. All right, another um, another important slide here. We said that there was two types of benchmarking. It was strategic, which is the executive level. They set the tone. They're all, they're all about maybe introducing a new product line or something like that. And then they have the operational, which is where most of us are at. You know, we want to change our process. Uh, we want to get a higher yield rate. We want to have faster delivery of our parts. So, so we have two types. But we, of the two types, these are the sources of benchmarking data. So I have two types, strategic and operational. I need to get data to, su to support either one of them. I'll show you another. You'll see another template here in just a few minutes. But just know that there's four types of places to get data. And Judith, this might answer some of your question, too. Excuse me just a second. <coughs> okay, so... Our sources are internal. You know, that's where we compare our processes and products to other uh, departments within the same organization. Competitive, that's where our, we're looking at the products, services, and processes of competitors compared with our organizational's uh, operations data. Functional, all right, that's a focus on a practice itself of a specific type, marketing or manufacturing, not necessarily specific to the organization's industry. Okay, so that, that's 
almost how I was describing Kentucky Fried Chicken. You have to get that stuff delivered up there. So I'm, I'm focusing on a practice here. And the practice is delivery of product. All right, so I'm looking at FedEx. I'm looking at um, airlines. I'm looking at uh, UPS. So those are the things that a functional benchmark would do with me in a perhaps a military-related uh, comparison. And then you have generic. This is the comparison of processes with those of world-class company not part of the same industry. You'll see this come up on another slide, but you know, the easiest thing I can think of is um, Southwest Airline wanted to increase their baggage speed, so they benchmarked NASCAR on pit stops. So that would be a generic uh, benchmark. All right, we'll go to the next slide. We'll, we'll see, you'll see this information come back again. All right, so here's some actual um, examples of benchmarks. So you see the initiator on the left. These are the Southwest Airlines. Their, their process was about trying to get faster plane turnaround time. So they did a generic benchmark of Indy 500 pit crews, not NASCAR. All right, now here's another one. This, this is almost like you, the C-130 project here. You have the initiator, which is Xerox, talking about warehousing operations, and they studied L.L. Bean. I think we would argue that there's probably more efficient uh, um, warehousing operations like Amazon, probably even, you know, you take Target and Walmart, they all have these massive distribution centers. But uh, that's that was their example. All right, and then IBM, you know, here's another generic for them. They're trying to look for ways to reduce uh, theft, and they turn to Las Vegas casinos. All right, so look, you know, those are not, those are apples to oranges. But they're still actual uh, um, benchmarks because what you're benchmarking isn't the process of theft reduction. It's the process that other people use that reduces theft that you could probably introduce into your process someplace. If that makes sense. You'll see more as we go. Hope everybody sees this, how we're, you know, we're not looking at exact uh, process streams here. But this is the loosest. This is the loosest of a benchmark comparison. At the end of the day, you only have a qualitative result. In other words, if we put this in, yeah, we should get some improvement. Well, where if I was looking for a quantitative result, if I'm producing a yield rate of 98, and, I, and I'm going to compare myself to another company. I, I'm hoping I'm comparing to someone with a 99.9 .9 yield rate, so that I can walk away with some uh, quantitative data on the changes we need to make in our in our process stream. Okay, as a reminder, there's there's two types of benchmarking. We have operational. All right, that's us at the uh, at the work level, working on a process, a product. some examples of operational. All of you have operational benchmarks from what I've read. All right, so here, you know, some examples improve the onboarding process of new employees. Improve the process of making a thing. Those are operational. All right, strategic, the executive guys. They're going to focus on something for the whole company, enterprise-wide. Maybe introduce a new product in there, establish a new performance management system, or establish a customer-centric culture. All right, so now what you're seeing here. This makes a great slide in your final slide deck, the one that you'll present on the last day. You could be talking about your, um, you know, you're not gonna, you know, you don't have to benchmark, but in your secondary, you could be talking about some of these things that you researched out. All right, so we know that Everybody has an operational benchmark, but perhaps there's some kind of strategic uh, benefit from your benchmark. So what we're doing here, and you'll see, and this isn't filled out right now, and next week it'll be more clear to you. But if I was looking for, um, let's take, we'll just take the C-130 readiness time. And if I was looking for an operational competitive benchmark, my competition could be the Air National Guard's PJs. They maintain uh, C-130s for those guys to go jump out of that. 
So that could be a competitive benchmark against them. In other words, they have an up rate of 99%. You have an up rate of only 70%. That would be your competitive benchmark. Likewise, if you were looking for something strategic for the C-130s, you could say not only is it uh, for, this would be the executives of your company saying, no, not only do we want it for our SAR aircraft, but we want quicker turnarounds for all of our C-130s. Uh, our, our logistics haulers need to have the same uptime. So that, that would be a strategic view. All right. Can anybody think of what a functional operational benchmark would be for your project? Anybody want to try one? Remember the definition of functional was just, it's not the whole process. We're looking at um, the, perhaps the manufacturing steps. Okay, I'll go on. All right, I'll be bringing this uh, matrix back to you next week. All right, we're we're at uh, is it 9:15. We're doing good on our time here. Um, we're rolling into the about the last 10 slides or so. Okay, so benchmarking. You're going to look at a lot of different uh, um, models. I'd say look at them like recipes, just like a baker looks at baking something. So each one's a little different, and they're not necessarily derived from each other, but it's what each company um, thinks it should look like. All right, the first one we're going to look at is ours here at NGS, and then we're going to look at some other ones. Let me put an important bullet here. It says, our NGS degree program incorporates benchmarking into the domain methodology. That's why you do not have to do a full-on benchmark here. Okay, this looks like an eye chart. But I'm going to pause on this for a minute. You're going to need this. You need to, you need to mark this slide. You need to print this slide. Because as you go on through the, uh, through the course here, these are... These are the actual steps to conduct a benchmark. This is adapted from uh, Watson. It's also adapted from Camp. Um, the idea here is to show you the steps. So if you look across the top there, you'll see um, 1.0, launch investigation into the possibilities. All right, this is where you're starting to brainstorm. You could have a simple, a simple team sitting around a table. I call them bog sat. A bunch of guys sitting around a table, bog sat. All right, these guys ain't going to do the work. These are the thinkers who don't do the work. These are the guys who give you the work to do. All right, so so during this particular phase, at the launch phase, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out, hey, there's something wrong with our system. You know, I think we need to get some folks together and and benchmark this. All right, so they then select the project team and they set the expectation. So it usually means this, hey, Kevin, you're selected for this team. I'm going to give you two months. I need you to tell me um, how we compare in this subject versus the best in the world. And that's all you get for guidance. So that's what you get for 1.0. It's, it's that first, first look. It's the recognition that your process stinks and you need to make a change to it. All right, then you see step two, organizing for benchmarking. Now you have your team defined. All right, so if you look up there, you see in the green right below two, three, four, and five, that green thing, that is the pre uh, benchmarking project team. You've chartered them, and they are together as a whole group for that, for the remainder of the benchmark. These are the people going out to do it. So before they, they, they show up and they start actually doing this, they have to do some things, and that's what 2.0 is. 2.0 is you identify our customers' needs. Perhaps it could be that our customers are tired of us giving them faulty material. It's time late, and it's uh, got a high fail rate. All right, so we want uh, their need is to have a, a, a better product in a timely manner. All right, so then we analyze 
our stuff, analyze process flow and metrics. It means that we have to one, understand it's your as is state and the metrics that go with it that say, you know, what's what our waste is in our in our cycle. We, in other words, have to be subject matter experts on our process. All right, then we need to identify all the process puts. It's your SIPOC, and I saw that in the two I opened. So you've got a SIPOC. All right, then you have to collect baseline data. This is the most important thing you do. You have an as-is state, and you've already, um, you know, we already, we already know that you already know your initial yield rates. So that's that is your baseline data. Then you develop a hypothesis, and the hypothesis simply says this: If I look at company X. I would expect to find a um, a new machine that would reduce our process time for QA by 10 minutes. It could be something like that. That's what the hypothesis is. All right, then you conduct secondary benchmarking. All right, so this secondary benchmarking has one little box down there. But I can tell you, and in my time with benchmarking, it takes weeks sometimes to get secondary benchmarking. It's going to take you a couple weeks to do secondary benchmarking on your own project as well. So it's a little box that has a lot of weight in it. Next, you're over into the 3.0 column that says reach out. So what's happening now is from the time that you've gone from 2.0 to 3.0, you found your company, you've reached out to the company, and they're going to open their door to you. And they're going to let you in and look at their process. And this could be an internal customer. It could even be an external one if they're willing to, uh, to share their processes with you. But at this point, at 3.0, we have, we have a good plan of what we want. So in this particular one, we, we know what our process is. We know where we're ailing. And we've looked secondarily, and we see a bunch of things that might help us. So in the reach out phase, now we need to, deform, uh, to perform, determine our performance measures, the things that we want to look at most within the, uh, within the as is stream. We want to analyze that data, secondary data, which will help us focus uh, questions and, and organize how we're going to go about our benchmark. We also develop our, our instrumentation, which is these survey and interview guides. So when you're actually physically in the plant, you know, you have you could have three or four people out there and we're all working off the same guide, asking the same questions to everybody that we interview. All right, then we develop a plan for collecting that primary data. In other words, everybody's gonna ask these five questions to management and these ten questions to the line so that everybody's doing the same function out in the field. And then you physically go, where it says conduct uh, primary benchmarking. On my benchmarking team, that's when we arrived in Halifax for our first benchmark. Everything behind it had already been done. There was no changing the templates at that point. We were launched. So now you've went out and you conducted your benchmark and you've completed all the, the questionnaires. Now, number four is you have to assimilate that. Assimilate is just a fancy word for analyze. So we're going to analyze our data. We're going to compare the performance levels of the target organization against us. <clears throat> we're going to compare the um, uh, we're analyzing their practices, and then we're developing recommendations. So you're going to have two things. You're going to come out and you're going to say, "Look, you told me to go look at X. I looked at X, and here's the direct comparison." Oh, by the way, boss, when I was looking at X, I found Y. Y is a new way of combining steps two and three out here. And if we buy this new photo spectrometer, I can save 10 minutes of a paint inspector's time um, of them having to dry paint and then compare it against a color chart. It could be something that easy. So at the end of the day, you might have put two months in here, but all, all it's going to boil down to is you buying a $4,000 spectrophotometer that's going to increase your uh, QA paint quality time. It could be something as simple as that. Or it could be completely different. Where, look, they don't even follow the same process as we do. Here's what our new process should look like. But in this step 4.0, this is where you are doing the, the heavy head work that says, all right, I saw the other company. They're bigger. They're a monster compared to us. 
Now I need to morph theirs into something this company can do. And you're developing those recommendations. And of course, the last step is you got to do something with it. All right, so that's where you're, you're presenting to senior leadership and you're making your implementation plans work. All right, that's the, that is the NGS model. And I'll tell you, I've used it. Uh, I've lived in this thing. And it's uh, one that you should have in your library. And you'll certainly uh, see it plenty as we work our way through this course. I did not um, make this, by the way. All right. Everybody knows to make. I, I've seen it in your presentations. I know you got it, so I'm not going to spend any time uh, telling you anything about to make, except to say that you see the two arrows on the left, one that says usually starts here, and then it says integrates down below. What they're showing you is how here at NGS uh, benchmarking integrates within your program. So you guys have learned enough. You've already you've already been doing other class, uh, classes that defined your product, uh, your defined your problems, and you've got your uh, senior champions. All that business is going on. But within your project, this is where de where benchmarking would fit within the DMAIC model in the bigger scheme of things. So as you gather slides from this course, they will fit somewhere in the measure, analyze, or improve part of your storytelling of your MVP. All right, I think these questions might be a bit much to ask, but we'll try one right now. All right, so can a benchmark study be internal and generic at the same time? All right, so remember, internal is the easy one. We know we're going to compare ourselves to a, uh, organ, a department within our organization. And then generic was the benchmarking uh, where you're going out to compare abstractly, perhaps uh, airline to... Um, to the pit crew. So can you do benchmarking that has more than one category? What do you think? I think it should be, you, you probably can. Okay. Uh, can you think of any example that you might be able to state? I know you haven't had time to really Sorry. munch munch on this long, but so the thing that just came to mind, and I don't know if it exactly fits. Um, the so the work that Cameron and I do, we're quality inspectors, and our issue is that we have rejections mostly because of paperwork errors. And the one thing that I can kind of think of, and I don't know if it counts as generic, is look at our financial department. Uh, mostly anything to do with contracting because if those guys have an error on their paperwork or anything that they contract on it's I'm sure it's highly visible okay Edgar you gave a but good again, I don't know if that would you you just described generic benchmarking because it's not an exact process even though it's internal to your organization you know you've gone after someone in a different uh, line of work to see what they're going to do so that's a generic, you know, internal would be to look at someone with an identical line to you and see how their paperwork looks. So yeah, good. That is good. All right. So let's look at the second question there. Benchmarking can uh, have a performance focus or a perceptual focus. I haven't really talked about that. So you just got to accept that sentence for what it says. Can you do it? Can you do a benchmark that has performance fo fo focus or a perceptual focus? And do you know what it means? So, you know, we know from what I told you, most of what we're working on now in our projects is performance focus. We're trying to, we're trying to cut something out of the process. We're trying to lean it out by making it faster. Um, or we're trying to uh, reduce our, our rejection rates. So those are performance focus. What do you think a professional, a, per, a perceptual focus benchmark might be? All 
a couple of years ago, Toyota ran into a real problem. Toyota is considered one of the best uh, QA organized uh, companies in the world. In fact, you know, the Toyota Way is a, uh, uh, hopefully in your library. Uh, if not now, it probably will be in another course. But, you know, we study how Toyota went about uh, engineering their lines. But a couple of years ago, they got a really bad rap um, because of their accelerator pedals. I'm sure everybody remembers that, all the recalls and then, then the lawsuits. And then, and then Toyota didn't want to own up to it right away. So what a perceptual focus would be is that, oh, Toyota says, man, you know, this product's solid. You know, maybe, maybe we did make a mistake. Maybe we need to put a hook latch into our carpets or, you know, they, they need to find a way to do the fix. The fix is a performance fix, but that isn't the problem. The problem wasn't that the accelerator was sticking. The problem was that people um, thought that their quality was going down and that their communication was incorrect. So the perceptual focus needed to be how to reinstill into the customer base um, that Toyota's uh, commitment to quality also extends to their safety. So th the benchmarking that they do at that point is is communications. How, does our, how do we communicate to our foreign customers uh, that we care about them and we're not just an engineering company. So that could be a perceptual focus. None of you guys have that going on with yours. So it's just an opportunity to talk about that you could benchmark something a little more abstract than, than what we're doing here. Okay, so earlier I showed you the NGS model. I'll flip back to it. I chart for sure, but once you start looking at it, It'll, it, it all makes sense. It's almost like a book on one page. All right. So now what I'm going to show you here is some other people's. This is Bristol Myers benchmarking process. It's a seven step process. So they say, you know, do these seven steps and that's what we're going to do for our company. You know what? That works for them. I'm not going to read each of these. You can come back to this and, and you're not going to be asked to, to define and design someone else's process. All this is is a demonstration that other companies have other ways of doing the same thing that we've done with the NGS model. Here's AT&T. This is what they've adopted for their company's benchmarking process. So it looks to me that they've got four, five, six, seven, eight. They've got a nine-step process. Remember, NGS has a five-step process. This is a nine-step process. Here's the uh, here's the federal benchmarking model. We've broken it into two: applying, conducting the study, and then applying the results. You could actually look at them as a two-step process. And then the last model uh, I want you to look at is the Xerox benchmarking process. All right, so they've tied it. If you look over on the left, like how we use uh, Demaic, Xerox was using this PAIAM as their, um, their process improvement guide. So they're trying to show how each of that fits within their, or their, their cultural view of quality. All right, this is from your book, Watson. So if, if you were ever asked to go out and do a strategic benchmarking process, these are the steps you would do. When you look at NGS, NGS is more of an operational benchmarking practice designed for our students. So this would be the executive level look. We're not going to be I'm not going to be playing with this any further than showing you it right here tonight. However, though, you are going to be doing this. 
So your first assignment is that as a team, you need to you need to produce secondary benchmarking. All right, remember, there's two types of benchmarking, primary and secondary. You have to do secondary before you can do primary. You do not have to do a primary for your project. It's, so I'm, that's been super clear in this, this, this presentation tonight, but you are gonna do some secondaries. Secondary says, hey, who can I look at for a process that would uh, be better than mine? And we've talked about a couple of ways to look at that tonight. Maybe you look at um, other delivery agencies, maybe you look internally at other departments within your organization. Uh, maybe you look at just just the one little function you want to change and then and look at it um, from that view. So here's how, how you go about secondary benchmarking. So you've got your process. We'll take the uh, um, we'll take the C130 and the in the downtime. So potential topics for your benchmarking. Uh, it could be um, delivery time, it could be failure rate, uh, it could be um, supplier, it could be supplier backlogs. These are different topics that you would you would then start searching on to see if you could find anything that would lead to a best practice. So if you look across the top, you're looking at uh, potential topics that you can you can start searching for. So this first project is a team project. You're you're just trying to define the things within your MVP that uh, that that could be researched. So what's going to happen is you're going to turn in as a team this sheet. You're going to fill out as much as you can because you're going to take these sheets individually. And everybody is going to produce six annotated bibliographies. So what happens is most teams will, will fill this out the best they can. And then they divide up what's on this list. And that becomes the six things you're looking for out there. So you don't really need to do an internet search here to, to develop this. You just have to meet as a team and start brainstorming what are the topics that we can be searching for secondarily through databases, like it could be ProQuest, or it could be Google, or, or it could be ASQ, I don't know. Um, you, know you can think abstractly, or you can think uh, uh, linearly on your, how your process goes. And you know, if you're looking for yield rates, you know, one of the benchmarking thing is, is uh, how to measure yield rate. You know, maybe you, maybe there's a new way to measure it that you haven't considered before that could produce a more accurate result. That's a, that would become a best practice later. Um, but sometimes when you're doing these abstract thoughts, you don't worry about doing them because it helps you to understand your process better. So sometimes you'll throw a, you know, how does that relate directly into my, my, my process? Well, it's helping you uh, educate yourself on how people are thinking about their similar processes. So as you go through your first week here, you, you like to say this will end up being a deliverable and you'll see it in the, uh, in the course materials. Someone from the team will submit one of these uh, for the whole team and fill these out the best you can. Um, I, most teams have like a you know, Saturday meeting or something like that, or you collaborate on email, however you do it. Um, brainstorm out, try and fill this page up if you can. And if you can go so far as to who on your team is going to do the investigation, this helps you when you get to uh, the next assignment for the uh, individuals. Oops. Sorry about that. Here we go. So here's the team assignment. Draft an MVP secondary benchmarking plan. That's that template from the slide before, and it's also available on the, on the portal. The team should develop the key topic areas for benchmarking, assign the responsibilities, and generate an initial list of key search words and resources. All right, so this is one to two slides. All right. So, look, it says do lesson three. 
So here's what you do. Let's start thinking about it. You can even look at next week's lesson, which is going to dive into these uh, into these slides a little bit. So it's it's I can tell you right now, the the DQs, the discussion questions for this week, get you thinking about your project, and filling out this template's not a hard thing to do. Just uh, think of it in the sense that hey, we we need to divide and conquer. So we need some keyword searches. That's really what this is all about. How do we how do we divide up um, amongst our team enough for everybody to go and search? So when you look at one team, you know you got a five-person team. You know each going to produce six. You know so you're going to have a whole bunch of these in the end to look at. So you need to have plenty of stuff for people to start searching on. All right, so for next week too, you need to uh, uh, you need to print out Almar case study, and I say print it out because you'll take some notes on it as uh, I introduce it to you next week. And that's the best way to to attack the Almar is uh, you'll use a highlighter and a pen, and and you can it's like an Easter egg hunt in there to to look for all the things that's wrong with the company. You can also review what your individual secondary benchmarking is going to be. So that's the follow on to this right here. So you, this will lead into the templates and I will explain that further next week. All right, so you're way ahead. You know, you can start thinking about your secondary benchmarking. It's not due until um, the beginning of week three. Uh, answer the DQs this week. I'm available online. Um, I have to tell you, it's better it's better for you to uh, send me an email than it is to call. Just uh, I'm, I'm in the classroom most of the day, and I don't have my phone uh, even uh, set to ring while it's the work day. So send me an email, and then I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can if you have questions. Also, the um, it's, it, you, know, you can post away on the uh, discussion boards as well. I look at them daily, and I provide feedback uh, uh, for many of the posts that will go up there. So do I have questions? I hope you're still awake. I hope I didn't bore you. Uh, Professor Matthew had one on the chat. OK. It says, Professor, how does one obtain the necessary materials to do a primary benchmarking when so much proprietary? That's the hardest part. All right, on primary benchmarking, when it's internal, people will open the doors, right? Because you are company to company. Um, when it's external, they have to be willing to open the door. They may not open the door for you. So let me write that back to them. Internal is easy to get the door open. So when it comes to primary benchmarking, you know, you think Walmart's going to let you in to look at their whole organization? No. All right, but they do subscribe to environmentally safe practices. So let me give you a quick one right now. So a company was uh, uh, studying Walmart on their meat packing. They're a huge meat packer. And... Uh, they were looking at how they drive down costs, and Walmart was willing to share with the other meat packing company how they do it. If you were to look uh, maybe 10 years ago and you bought a pound of hamburger from Walmart, you opened up the package and you'd see like a little uh, plastic uh, with um, an absorbent material in the middle of it that soaked up the, um, the, the meat byproduct in there. So there's a little piece of paper in there. Well, they removed that piece of paper by building into the styrofoam ribs. So if you go in now, that, that little plastic paper is not in there anymore. That plastic paper was one-tenth of one cent. 
that plastic paper, when you you combine that by a hundred million times, is a lot of savings to the company on the end. So so that was a functional benchmark on packaging hamburger or packaging meat for Walmart. Some companies will open up their door um, and let you do stuff like that, but they're not going to let you see everything. Hope that makes sense. Okay, where are we at now? We're at uh, 945, is that right? And uh, we've we brought the train into the station a few minutes earlier uh, than I thought we would. I'm not a hanger honor. I got the information out I needed. So this next part is I will answer your questions until you're tired of me. Um, and if you're tired of me now, please leave and have a good night. I, I'm glad I'm your teacher and uh, we'll, we'll have a good month together. Sir. Hey, Roger that, sir. Good night. Good night. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night. Uh, Professor, um, uh, Cameron and I were uh, just communicating on the side, and I think he said that he's going to be submitting the, or, yeah, submitting uh, our information into the tracker. Um, we emailed uh, Professor, our cohort, Professor Ellinger, mm -hmm. uh, that unfortunately, because of uh, Mark being away on travel, we weren't able to get him to sign the charter. Uh, so that's the only reason why we kind of held back. Um, but we do have it together. We just need to put it into the tracker. Well, that's good, and I appreciate that. You know, um, that'll let me help you as we get into the course a little bit deeper. And, uh, you know, I, I know you're looking for your yield rate, right? And that's what you're you're hoping to have is a better yeah. yield rate. Yeah. All right. All right. So, you know, this course is really straightforward. You know, just, you know, you're going to be out there hunting, Easter egg hunting for uh, ways to improve your yield rate. Maybe you need another machine. Maybe you need another QA check. I don't know. Maybe there's a maybe there's a thing out there that can help you reduce the variation. Yeah, I was coming up with a when we when you were talking about the uh, the template toward the end of the six uh, mm -hmm. six, six things that we could come up with. Um, there's some of those that we've kind of thought of. Uh, so I think Cameron and I just need to get together and hash those up to see which ones we definitely want to look at. That's right. You know, you guys know your process. Um, and you don't need to overthink it either. But the idea is you get a couple of people in a room and you start bouncing, bouncing the ideas out. And they'll go ahead and come up with something you didn't think you were going to come up with. Just get a nice big list of things to search for. Okay. All right, um, Cameron, you still there? Yes, I am. All right, I'll just uh, I'll check in a day or so, and I'll look and see that you at your MVP and and check it out. Look forward to it. All right. Okay. Thanks, Professor. Have a good hey, night. Are you guys in the Arizona UTC? Yes. Oh yeah. Yes, sir. All right. All right. I'm glad. I'm sure you guys are glad it's cooling down. I live in San Diego here. Yeah, well, it was oh today. yeah, that that'd be really nice weather. Yeah. All, all my family lives in Phoenix, though. So. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will uh, right after this, because I, I have the all my tracker information on my work laptop. So I just got to open that up, and then I can upload the the PowerPoint for you. All right. Were you able to get a grade out of your last class without having it uploaded? Um, no, it's not finalized yet. Uh, that's what we're waiting to hear. Yeah.
So you're literally just waiting for a charter to be signed? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's it. All right. Yeah. From a from a former NGS graduate at that, right? Yep. And I and I had uh, talked with Mark uh, about a week or two ago. Um, you know, giving him a, a heads up that he'd have to sign it. But you know, unfortunately, he did have to go on travel. So it's <laughs> it kind of just it sucked the way that you know the time frame and everything worked out. Yeah. Well, fortunately, NGS is usually very lenient on stuff like that, and uh, I'm sure it doesn't impact your final grade. Okay. I, I yeah, don't in, know. In, yeah, in the, but, <laughs> in the but, email that we that we sent to uh, Mr. Ellinger, we you know we we told him that you know as soon as he does come back into town, we can, I mean, we can we can upload the the charter now, um, but if he's and then we can.